Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Throw and Bones Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. I'm your host as always, Adam Gerber, and with my amazing co-host, Kyle Wheeler. We're going to bring all the news of the fight week to you this week, and we also have an, an exclusive interview with uh, UFC's Thomas Gifford coming out later this week. Uh, we just finished interviewing him. It was a great interview. Learned a lot about him. Uh, learned a lot about his fight prep and, and where he's going, and he's going to be the uh, featured bout the third fight down the card right before the co-main event on uh, UFC Tampa, the Yo- Yoanni and Jacek versus Michelle Watterson card, and that's going to take place on October uh, 12th. So keep your eye out for that interview. It's coming out next week. Uh, right now, though, what's on our minds, Kyle? UFC 243. UFC 243, but before we can even get our minds around that, before we can even wrap it around that uh, incredible uh, record-breaking event that's coming up in uh, Melbourne, we first need to get over the super stacked and, and uh, worth it, I'd say, uh, card that happened in UFC Copenhagen. We promised the people sparks. We promised them fireworks. We promised them action. We promised them drama. And I would say that uh, we fulfilled all of those promises. Or Copenhagen did, should I say. Yeah, we did. That was a great night of fights. Uh, sorry, I'm just pumped up for this weekend. I jumped the gun a bit there. UFC 243, what can I say? I can't stop thinking about it. But UFC Copenhagen, that was a great card. That was a very surprising finish, and uh, yeah. Jeez, yeah. I was surprised how, uh, like, that's something that we learned this week. We learned that uh, Ovin St. Prue can give anyone the Von Flew choke, and then we should probably rename it to the St. Prue choke. Yeah. Uh, We learned that Jan Kutalaba, not only does he have some takedown chops, but that his ground and pound is terrifying. I've had several nightmares about it since the card. And we also learned... That Jared Cannonier is a bad, bad man. Yeah, he's a bad man. I'm That's sure we knew sure. that already, but uh, top five for sure. What would you like to see next for Cannonier? Cannonier, oof. Well, I put a post up on the Throwing Bones underscore MMA Instagram account, and I would like to see him fight, as you would say, the gatekeeper, Yo Romero. Whoa, I would not. <laughs> Let's 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 roll it back. Let's backpedal a little bit whoa, 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 on no the gatekeeper. No I've way. never called Yoel Romero a gatekeeper. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I don't know the definition. I'm sorry. So gatekeeper is uh, well, I, he could be a gatekeeper, but to the championship. Well, I he's would say, the guy. To contendership. He's the guy. He's if you beat him, you, you get a shot. Yeah, if you beat him, you're next. Um, so you'd rather see uh, Jared Cannonier coming off a win over uh, Jack Hermanson and Anderson Silva. You'd rather see him, and David Branch, don't forget. You'd rather see him go against the uh, Yoel Romero going off a loss? or I, And I've seen most people say that. To me, why would you not make uh, him versus Costa for the number one contender? Or even have him fight the loser of Adesanya versus Whitaker? Well, because I've heard from Dana White that Costa's getting the next shot for sure. Yeah. So And so, Romero or the loser of Whitaker Adesanya for, for Cannoneer? Romero. You think so? Yeah. Why? 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 Why do you want to see that more? Because Costa already beat you, all, Romero. Yeah. He said he was getting the shot. When you when you say something, you yeah. follow through with it. So Costa gets the winner of Whitaker Adesanya. Yeah. But Cannoneer, should he fight Romero or should he fight the loser of Whitaker Adesanya? What are you more interested? in? I'd be more interested in see him seeing the uh, versus the loser the championship fight. To me, R- Romero. Uh, needs to win one or two before he's even in back in contention. Yeah, loser, that's fair. And I, I feel like Jack Hermanson is enough of a feather in your cap I, I that you shouldn't say, have to fight Romero right now. I wouldn't after. say, though, because Yo Romero, his last two or three fights were against Robert Whitaker, close decisions. His last three yeah. fights were close Claire, decisions. Claire, close decisions, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, he's still right there. Nothing's really changed too much for him. And, yeah, Jared Cannonier. That'd be an interesting test for him against Absolutely. such a strong wrestler like that. Um, I would love to see him against the winner of Izzy and Whitaker. Mm-hmm. I, I just never it's thought a, of that. It so is I a must hot say, division right now. I must say, Adam, you're a smart man. I must say. <laughs> it is I didn't hot, think of that one. Very hot division. Um, I thought the fight was over in the second round when Hermanson took Cannoneer's back. I thought it, that was it. Yeah, like I don't know about you sitting at home, but I said out loud, I said, that's it, it's over. Hermanson's got him. But the fact that Cannonier was able to keep his composure and 
keep not only keep from getting submitted, but stand up against probably one of the most prolific uh, submission threats and ground and pound threats in that division. Uh, impressed me to the point that uh, I now believe in him as a contender. For me, this was a sort of, can you, a, a proving it performance. It was seeing whether or not he could truly handle the grappling or if it was going to be more of a war of attrition and if he was really uh, adverse to being taken down and if it was going to go really wrong for him on the ground. He showed that he uh, knows exactly what to do. He showed a methodical knowledge of how to stand back up and then he uh, carefully and insightfully implemented his stand-up game. Yeah, no, it was it was truly awesome to see. I just think uh, since he's fought up at heavyweight and light heavyweight, you know, he was you know two hundred and forty pounds or so not long ago. Uh, I think that just carrying that extra weight, I think he's just so so much stronger, and he just has has such so much power behind his punches that that he's really going to be a problem, especially now that he's seems to be coming into his own. He's He's figuring everything out, not just uh, his skill set, but mentally he seems very, he seems very content being in there. So when you see the commitment level is completely different. Training in Arizona now, uh, not working full time, not working full time in Alaska as a as a baggage operator in an airport. Yeah, the the story of him not only coming from those humble beginnings and and from working full time and training part time. Uh, but also being at heavyweight and, and the, the journey of him finding his true weight class and how to make his style work there. Uh, it's been a very uh, thrilling journey to follow, and I can't wait to watch it culminate at the top. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see what's next for him. That was, uh, like, I don't think too many people were thinking Kanye was going to win this weekend. It was actually quite surprising seeing how, how strongly the people were rooting for Hermanson, so... Mm-hmm. It was awesome, especially his last two fights. He's walked into enemy territory and got the got the Silenced job done. Them. Yeah, what a speech afterward, hey! Yeah. Especially after being uh, pretty much booed into silence in in uh, Brazil after defeating Anderson Silva, he went up there and he took everything, every minute they gave him, and then more. He said, "You know what? You guys had the fight booked for five rounds. I ended it in two, so I got three rounds worth of talking to do, and boy, he made the most of it. That was one of the most compelling post-fight speeches I've heard in a long time. Yeah, that was awesome. That, that was sweet. So. Man, for sure. It was yeah. really, really satisfying to see him uh, be able to get everything off his chest and, and really be proud of his performance. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure he was, he was happy to, to win that way, and you know, that's awesome he took the time to, to do that. <laughs> Uh, next we're going to go over, uh, talking about surprising ways the fight went, uh, Nelson versus Burns. I was expecting a lot more, uh, on the ground action and a lot less cage fighting in that. What did you think of that performance from the two of those guys? Yeah, I mean, it was an all right fight. It was definitely not what I was expecting, but you never do know. Um, it, I, it was a bit of a letdown for me and they, perhaps what it was is that they neutralized each other a little bit more than I, I figured they would. Yeah. I just don't like I, Gunner. I just don't see um, like too, too much like difference in his game. Right, every every fight it seems kind of like he has yeah. the same strategy, which is fine. You know, it's just his style and everything. But it seems almost it be, stubborn. It would be nice to just kind of see him maybe change a few things up and and maybe you know I, I don't know what it is. He is a great fighter. He's got a great skill set. So it'd just be awesome to see him. In, improve a little bit more yeah it seems like he he's not he's really interested in making his specialties work and not as interested in in rounding out his game to you know know, emphasize what he's good at yeah so yeah it's tough to see him the way he is right now it's tough to see him becoming a championship level fighter especially at welterweight right yeah because the division is so stacked right now and it's stacked with with very uh high paced and strong wrestlers and and very competent grapplers too so it's not like he's just going to be able to get the jump on them in that way yeah Yeah, so it's going to take a little bit more uh moving down the card a little bit farther we got ian kutalaba versus khalil roundtree we were both very excited uh for bangkok ready khalil roundtree and we also uh you especially put your stamp on this as uh, your number one nomination for the Throw and Bones certified banger of the night. Yeah. How did that? How did this fight live up to that for you? It was good, but it, it was it was a really good fight. It just sucked to see Khalil lose uh, in that fashion. Yeah. But um, it's all good. It's part of the game, and. Yeah, Kutalaba looked really good in there. So well, now, uh, now Khalil just has to move to Dagestan. Yeah, for six months, and uh, he'll just go train under Abdelmanap. 
in the mountains of Dagestan. Yeah, and then he'll, he'll have sprawl training down. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, Khalil, it just was one of those things. Khalil just he hit him with some big shots. He still, uh, it just didn't really phase Eon. Well, it did, but it did. he was able to to grab onto him and. Mm-hmm. Really he came ground. in, I thought, with a really good game plan and a much higher fight IQ than we've seen from him in the past. Because usually he comes to swang and bang, yeah. throw them bungalows, and that's about it. He, yeah. he comes with those haymakers in his back pocket, and he's going to throw match until he's completely exhausted. Yeah, it was he just showed, a surprise, right? right? And he showed in this fight not only wrestling prowess, but his control of Khalil on the ground and ability to do damage to him at the same time. Yeah, truly scary and really, to me, uh, someone who was a Gunnar Nelson. You know, to just relate it back to what we were just talking about, a Gunnar Nelson esque talent where the potential is there tenfold, but he just didn't seem to have the skill set to fulfill his, uh, you know, athletic ability. Uh, this seems to be opening a new door to a bunch of new possibilities in his career at light heavyweight. Yeah, yeah, it was a great performance. It was a dominant performance, honestly. He, it it mean, makes me more excited for future Jan Kutalaba fights, if that's even possible. Yeah, no, exactly. He has a, uh, a fan-friendly fighting style oh, yeah. already, so um, you know, adding in that grappling, especially with the, the power he has, it's going to be great to see what that does for him. All right, on to another light heavyweight matchup. We learned that Michael, my boy... We had a nice little text conversation about this. My boy, Michael Oleksaychuk, we found out that his jiu-jitsu is not as slick as his boxing. Uh, Kyle, we were texting back, we were communicating during this fight. How amazing did his boxing look in that first round? Um, It looked okay. Like, it looked good, yeah, obviously. He was throwing hard shots and everything. In um, accuracy. The way yeah, he was working in the body. It was good, yeah. It was just, you know, OSP's experience, he just was unfazed even though he was eating such big shots he, they're doing damage he's good he a seemed great pretty job. phased yeah no me. but he did a great job even when he was he rocked did. you know he, he stayed composed and he got back to the game plan he got the, like he got the finish right so yeah. it was, ah, to go hey, it to, was, to take him down is one thing to go for a to go for a guillotine like ah. At, at what point? At what point do you just go never ever try a guillotine on Ovin Saint Preux? Yeah, I don't know why that was the strategy. It's just one of those things, you know. He came out and he was throwing such big shots, and you know it, he just gassed out quickly. So I'm sure he wasn't fully thinking. You know, he didn't have his, his legs underneath him. It seemed he was very tired. Um, and yeah, OSP. Uh, once again it's gets the com- it's comical at this point it's yeah it's hilarious i was i see yeah i lit you up on text i thought it was, I was funny. laughing oh and it was right, right in the middle i go i because you didn't know a whole lot about olex Chuck before this so i hadn't seen a lot of his performances i was like i told you he's a monster yeah that's you know and he, he's coming after his like he to me it, by the end of the first round it looked like it was a matter of time like the way he was digging those body shots and the way the OSP was sucking wind, but you can never count him out, and that's why I'm an OSP fan in the first place. The things that made me a fan of him were him fighting, breaking his foot, and then still coming out with the win, or fighting, breaking his arm in the second round, and still being able to take John Jones to a competitive decision. To be honest, I as OSP kept eating the shots and not going down, I realized I, the, I was like, I think he's gonna yeah. do this. I think he's gonna win. I didn't know how. I was even thinking maybe a knockout, maybe a catch him. Like, yeah. I think, uh, what's his name? How do you pronounce Olek it? Olek Sechuk. Olen Sechuk, yeah. O- Olek Sechuk. Olek Sechuk. Boom. There you go. Uh, Olek Sechuk. Um, I think he, he might have some problem the way he was boxing in there. You know, if, you know, some, some long guy, even OSP was throwing a couple knees and, when you're th- when you're thrown to the body like that, and he's just the way his head was positioned, he was just vulnerable. But to me, that's knee. why it's so impressive. Is he the way he uses his feints and his other shots to open up the body? Like to me, he it was it, it yeah. But his, when he was throwing a body shot, it was always while OSP was reacting to something else he had uh, thrown or looked like he was about to throw. Well, yeah, he was well, he was changing levels quite a bit on yeah. him and he was confusing them, but you know, it's pretty oh, to watch. Yeah, it's it, pretty it's, to watch. It's good to watch. It's awesome to watch. It's just in a sport, you know, with kicks and knees, it's going to it might you get Dan Hooker one day. Yeah, he might end up on the canvas because of that one day, but OSP man, 
what a performance. And and like you were talking about last week about him, it's just one of those things he just he just always finds a way to just pull it off. Yeah. Like, you know, and he stays in there. So Can we talk about uh, some celebrations here for a sec? We got to step back for a quick moment. Uh, I think that's pretty much all we have to say on Oleg Sechuk versus yeah. OSP. A fantastic fight. Uh, really looking forward to Oleg Sechuk's performances in the future. Hopefully he can, you know... Yeah, I like his fighting style. I love his fighting style. A lot of promise, right? Yeah. If he can patch up those grappling holes. So, uh, and having OSP in the division is always a fun thing. Should we change the name of the choke to the to the same Prue choke? Might so, as well, At this point, yeah. I think we should. The guy Might who it's well. named after did it like twice. Yeah. This is OSP's fourth yeah. high-level competition. At this point, if you get caught in it, it's... The same it's, Prue. I just don't, I don't even understand how you still get caught in it. Yeah. It's, it, it's just so it's his move but it's it's, it's crazy and to be that good at one submission and then have almost no other submissions yeah it's it's, it's, a, it's classic yeah. love, it's an enigma i yeah. love it uh going back a couple of fights two of the two of the winners above this kutalaba and burns shared uh post fight celebrations they did the same thing and i wanted to know did kutalaba's push ups in the middle of the octagon after knocking out Khalil roundtree was that a little bit more impressive to you than Gilbert Burns doing a bunch of push-ups after winning a lackluster decision? Oh, man, that's he got tough. He got booed pretty hard for that. Yeah, I mean, you can't really do push-ups after fighting, especially after a fight like that. But that's impressive. I mean, he was grappling a lot in right. there. I'm sure his arms were gassed. But, so. And I Good agree. Like, to me, that that is impressive. But it, does that send the wrong that's message a, to Yeah, the it's like a taunt to the crowd. It's like, hey, look at me. Like... I can still do 20 yeah. push-ups. Look at all this I mean? effort I didn't yeah, put into exactly. the fight. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Exactly. But but Kutalaba, on the other hand, that was that was beauty. I thought it's beauty after that. you finish yeah. someone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. exactly. Absolutely. It's classic. All right. <laughs> uh, next down the fight, we'll talk quickly about uh, Nicholas Dalby versus Cowboy Oliveira. What a comeback. What Unbelievable. a return to form. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And we forgot to mention this last time. I cannot... And I, I need to apologize to our listeners that I forgot to mention this because it's really the only thing we should have brought up when we were talking about Nicholas Dalby. His last fight before this in Cage Warriors, do you know how it ended? Yeah, there was so much blood on the canvas that they had to stop the fight because both guys were just slipping. Sliding around. Yeah. Did you go watch it? No, I didn't. It is unbelievable. It's like they're fighting on a slip and slide. Yeah, that's hilarious. No, yeah. I'm going to watch it here in the next couple of days. But... Definitely. If anyone, if all of our listeners have Fight Pass, absolutely look up uh, Nicholas Dalby in his last fight in Cage Warriors. It's Yeah, it sounds hilarious. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. It's one of the reasons why I love this sport is because you get to see these unusual and, and hectic things all the time. Yeah, never know what's going to happen. All right, uh, I'd say Macy Chason put on kind of a disappointing performance against Lena Landsberg. I was ex- excited for her to come back, but uh, she, I think she got too caught up um, trying to get it to the ground. I think she they had mentioned that she'd worked a lot on her ground and pound for this camp, and I think she got too caught up in trying to get Lena Landsberg to the ground and uh, get her ground and pound off and d- wouldn't just strike with her at range, which is where she really had the biggest advantage. I mean, no matter how good your ground and pound is, Lena, Landberg- Lena Landsberg's best spot is still in the clinch against the cage. And if that's how you're going to get it to the ground, you have to go through her greatest strength to get to her to get to get your greatest strength. And by the second round, halfway through the second round at least, she probably should have realized that it wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, yeah was a problem for her. hopefully this <laughs> is a prospect yeah. loss that you learned from yeah and who knows right she she hasn't fought in a little bit of time here right she like had eight, had month, a few eight things months eight months she had an on, injury so. in her yeah. foot and a crane fell on her house exactly so yeah. who knows you know she's gonna hopefully after this gets back in there maybe next time out she'll she feel a bit more comfortable so, in in there yeah something else i learned about her too is when she was a kid uh she was shot on the street just uh so randomly that's crazy yeah wow Almost died. That's crazy. Uh, moving on from that, we got uh, Mark Diakisi versus Lando Venata. And this was, to me, this was a really uh, exposing moment for where these two guys are in their career right now and, and really what the difference is and, and why maybe they shouldn't be equated. What, yeah. what did you think of the performance? What did you think of Mark Diakisi coming out with the win? I thought it was, it was a good performance on his end. Um, I mean, fight an incredibly high IQ fight. Yeah, and I just think that, um, I mean, he's a young guy, and 
he's had a few, like he was had a lot of hype around him. He's had a couple big wins at the start of his career. He had yeah. that beautiful knockout, mm-hmm. and I think just after you know having all that exposure and then you know come losing a few times. Mm-hmm. and then having you know to build himself back up from that and and he came back and won a really intelligent fight against joe duffy wasn't yeah. his flashy self he won points and he and he, he really built his game around winning every yeah, round. yeah because i remember watching that fight and um lots of people were kind of calling it like this could be you know yeah. it for him right mm-hmm. so you never After know the harik post fight, and, yeah. and yeah he did he did a really good job he really he really made the right adjustments and and seemed to be doing the right things to to get the win and prove the improve his fight IQ and prove his fight game, and he he really just seemed to step it up. Mm-hmm. We well, focused on that calf kick super early. Yeah, he nailed three really good ones right off the bat, and then from there it seemed like. Venata was playing catch up the whole time on one leg, and every time he got a little bit of momentum, Diakisi would completely shut that momentum down with a perfectly timed takedown, which is something he never would have done before. Yeah, and yeah, it was just beautiful, right? You know, he's kicking out the legs. He's not being so flashy, but when he first mm. came in, right, it was really flashy. Yeah. Uh, and now it seems he's kind of doing a few more smarter things to help him win the fights. Absolutely. And how do you feel about, there's a bit of a narrative coming into this that they were both in the same spot coming in, uh, in their careers. They had both just sort of got up back on track with a win. But to me, when you look back in retrospect, you look back at the records and it really wasn't comparable uh, at all. Like you compare Venata's comeback as a, a submission over probably one of the worst ground fighters in the UFC, uh, Marcos Mariano. Uh, and you compare that to a really well fought, technically sound shutdown of Joe Duffy, there's really no comparison, right? And I think Venata right now, his biggest problem in the octagon is his uh, inability or how slowly he adapts. Yeah, he just, like, he seems so, um, like, comfortable with just eating shots and you know yeah taking time to... he, ta- he takes way too long to adjust to danger and dangerous situations and go okay we can't let keep letting that happen <laughs> yeah it's like his kinda... leg has to be shutting down before he's like oh i probably shouldn't eat you don't eat any more leg kicks yeah so you it's know? it's one of those things um it's tough you know he's had some unreal fights in the ufc and you know he just hasn't really been able to to do enough to get the get the wins yeah put them all together and and mark on the other hand he's you know he's had the losses and you know we we see him doing the right things when he comes yeah. back i'd like to see uh, landon venata maybe just work on maybe a quicker start like because he's yeah it's yeah. every time diakisi comes back now there's a new layer that he's added whereas mm-hmm. venata seems like he's still trying to find his foundation yeah and he looks still looks different every time he comes into the octagon he's, he still doesn't it's it's so weird because his whole thing is groovy. It's it's I'm chill. I'm calm. I'm comfortable. Yeah. But he he he's so concerned with being comfortable in there that he almost looks uncomfortable. He looks like he's not there and aware and ready to adapt and adjust. He's more concerned with being loose. It's like at some point, at some on some level, you need to be dialed up and dialed in enough to realize that if you keep getting kicked in the calf, it's over. Like, he, he he switched stances, I think, way too late Yeah. in the fight. Yeah, it's just one of those things, like I said, it's just, he's an animal, man. Like, he's yeah. just so okay with, you know, taking shots, and he just wears them and, you know, keeps, like, just trying to plot through it. Right, so I, I, just, I just, as a fan, I wish he'd save it for when he needed it instead of just giving it to the guy in the first three minutes, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it'll be... It's one of those things, right? You, you learn, you learn as you lose. So. Going to tune in to eat both of these guys' fights either way. Yeah. And as far as Venata goes, the way he fights, it's one of those things where are you losing some? Yeah, but you're kind of uncuttable. Yeah, exactly. Because his fights, go watch them. They're yeah. awesome. And and Dia Cassie, I'm excited to see his next fight and the improvements oh, he makes. All right, we got one more thing to discuss this week, and it is. Uh, I guess we got. Maybe two more things, but we're going to go over Jack Shore versus Hernandez first. Jack Shore, another Welsh fighter, uh, looked incredibly impressive in his debut. He's a Japanese jiu-jitsu black belt and BJJ brown belt. Um, he cracked up Hernandez on the feet and absolutely dominated him on the ground. It just looked like a really promising prospect, and I'm excited to see where he goes from there. Yeah, no, yeah, that was an awesome fight, and I'm pumped to see see what's next for him as well. And he's now 12-0. and 0. Yeah.
So that's fantastic. And then we'll talk really quick about uh, Giga Chikatse versus Brandon Davis because the judges read the wrong decision. Yeah. When, when have we ever seen that before? So they announced Brandon Davis as the winner. It was actually Giga Chikatse, the winner by split decision. Yeah, that's crazy. I thought they announced it a draw. Uh, a dr- uh, it was a... I think it was a majority... Was it a draw? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they announced it a they draw. Na- or maybe a majority draw for after. Davis or something like that. I can't yeah. remember. Maybe. They had to reverse it either way. Yeah, I no, can't remember yeah, the last so. time they've had to do that. So, God, there's, there really is just something new every single time. Yeah, exactly. And that's literally the... The first time, um, like, first time that's happened in just like a prelim type of fight, right? It's not, not a main event or a big situation. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, you know, one of the first fights of the night. So, mm-hmm. all right. Well, that's all we got for UFC Copenhagen this week. There was a lot to talk about. It was really packed in there, and it was a, a great night of fights. Honestly, I'm jealous of Copenhagen that they got to see that live. That was quality quality card yeah that was awesome i would have been pumped to be there live for sure all right awesome we'll be right back to deal with the news this week and then we'll come back for ufc 243 uh thank you so much for listening so far make sure you follow us on on twitter and on instagram at uh throwing bones underscore mma make sure you join our group on facebook uh get in the discussions and make sure you come back uh later on in the week we got plenty of interviews coming your way exclusive interviews with uh, big names in the sport thank you guys so much for listening so far Welcome back to the Throne Bones MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Gerber, with Kyle Wheeler here. We're going to go over the news this week. Hey, Kyle? Yeah, we're going to do it. All right, let's do it. So first off, right off the bat, Stipe Miocic, even though Daniel Cormier has said he's on board for the rubber match, he said it's going to be his final fight ever. He's going to retire after the rubber match. Uh, Stipe Miocic is going to be out for the rest of the year with an eye injury. Yeah. Sustained in their rematch. Yeah, so... That's crazy. At least it gives both times a, a good amount of time to rest up. Speaking and of rematches and rebookings, we've also got Rodriguez versus Stevens rebooked for the co-main event of UFC Boston. I am pumped about that. Right, That's going to be a war, yeah. There you go. Some uh, bad blood there now, too. Uh, <clears throat> bad blood. Speaking of bad blood and maybe bad reputation, BJ Penn has officially been released by the UFC. Yep. Probably a good idea at it's this good point. News. Hey? Yeah, we've probably we've good. talked enough about BJ Penn. If you want to listen to some past uh, episodes, go to our news section. We've uh, we've chopped it up about BJ Penn more than enough. It's sad to see a legend go down that road. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely sad to see. Uh, speaking of sad to see legends going down that road, Shogun Hua is going to return at UFC Sao Paulo against Sam Alvey. So at least he's got a bit of an evenly matched opponent for that. Who are you picking in that fight? Going with. Sh- Sam LV. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stick with Shogun because I'm yeah. not ready to see that happen. And I honestly, at this point, I doubt that Alvi can throw a strike unless someone else throws one at him. And I think that Shogun's going to be smart enough to not get uh, hit with a counter left hook. Yeah, that's a good call. There you go. But at the same time, Shogun's at a point in his career where nothing would surprise me, which is why, you know. Yeah. Maybe call it, call it after this one, especially if it's in Sao Paulo, right? Retirement fight, very winnable retirement fight. That's true, yeah. Maybe we'll leave the gloves in the middle of the octagon. Oh, yeah, one can, one can only think about it. Uh, Usman versus Covington has been confirmed for UFC 245. And I want to know, what do you think about the placement of that bout on the order of the card? Should that go above or below Max Holloway versus Alexander Volkanovsky? I think it should go b- below. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, in, in every way. Yeah, I think, yeah, I just think Max Holloway. He draws more. Yeah, and he's also... You accomplished know, more. Yeah, he's accomplished more. He's a true legend. He's, he's The fight has a higher entertainment value. Yeah, you know, and especially with all this this shit that's going on with the, the booking of the fight. It's just, it's annoying. So yeah, why well, give him that, that big slot? Yeah, to me, to me, to put them above Max Holloway just because they're of a higher weight class would, would be borderline disrespectful. I'm even, I mean, and, and it is no secret on this show that I have a incredible infa- infatuation with Amanda Nunes. I would say that Amanda Nunes versus GDR could even go above them. Considering Amanda Nunes's uh, credentials, not really much to do with the fight itself or uh, true, yeah. GDR. But I think Amanda Nunes, her accomplishments on their own, it's Maybe true. I just all, like thinking about it too. Just now, how things work, like with the build up of the Usman and Kobe fight and everything, they're obviously going to promote it to be some some big thing. So I can understand why they'll probably put that 
on the main event, but the beef, it, yeah. it is disappointing because you know he's just it's just a show. It's just an act. Well, so. and they're not even good at it. Yeah, it's like you like, know, it's like it's like embarrassing. It's, it's like secondhand embarrassing. Watch. Yeah, it's yeah, tough exactly. to watch. Uh, Chai Lewis Perry. Do you know Chai Lewis Perry? Kickboxer, Muay Thai artist. So no. he's uh, sort of akin to Michael Jai White. Has just been uh, tested by USADA, which uh, w- can only mean usually people don't get tested by USADA for no reason. So hopefully means he's going to be making a transition over to MMA and is signed with the UFC. It'd be very interesting. We got Chikatse. Uh, we've got the Turkish Tyson. Uh, we've got all these people coming over. It's it's an exciting time for kickboxing and Muay Thai in the UFC. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I love to see that. I love that style, so love to see it in, in MMA. Oof. Okay, L- tell me if you love this. Vanderlei Silva has signed a deal with Bare Knuckle Boxing. Yeah, I knew that. That is, that's tough. Right? It's gonna, yeah, I don't know. Imagine, though, BKFC, Vanderlei Silva versus Chris Levin as a headliner. Are you going to buy that pay-per-view? I'm not going to buy it. I'll watch it online after. (laughs) I'm being honest with you. Honestly, (laughs) yeah. It's it's tough to justify the the bare knuckle. How do you feel about bare knuckle boxing in the first place? Is it something you're interested in or or pass on that? Yeah, it is interesting. It's just, I don't know, it's just one of those things that just kind of sucks because, you know, they're, you know... they're just gonna get so cut up and everything. Mm-hmm. It's gonna, it does, does permanent damage. Yeah, to their exactly. Face. Like, it's, like obviously you can get, you know, anything can happen in an MMA fight. You know, a boxing fight, you get cut up and you bleed. But you know, with bare knuckle, it just breaks skin. So, yeah, it's just bone on bone on bone, skin on skin. It's nasty. It's rough to watch, and at the same time, it's right now it's almost exclusively populated by people who didn't make it in another sport. I yeah. feel like I might have a different opinion on it if we get people who grow up as bare knuckle boxers and see the sport maybe evolve a little bit past just people who aren't good at other stuff taking their Did gloves off. Did you know uh, Thomas Gifford's upcoming opponent Brock Weaver uh has a bare knuckle boxing fight. Yeah, didn't he have he had it with uh, Joe Riggs, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So very that, impressive. that's that's very interesting, yeah. Uh, speaking of comebacks, Vanderlei Silva's comeback. Speaking of other comebacks, Dan Hardy plans to come back in early 2020. We've actually talked about this before. Once or twice, yeah. Awesome. That's that's cool. Good for Dan. But Are yeah. there any people in your mind that you think you'd like to see him come back against? Not really, to be honest. I don't know. I'd rather honest. see. I would rather see a Carlos off. Condit, uh, Dan Hardy rematch than see than watch Condit uh, fight Mickey Gall. Maybe that's what that Condit Mickey Gall fight is. It's the yeah, battle it's to who that. gets Dan Hardy maybe on his it comeback. Might be, it might be for that. Yeah, that would be that'd be a good decision uh, by the UFC. So we'll find out. Uh, let's keep going. We'll keep rolling here. Uh, Home versus Pennington, of course, is off for this week's fight. Yeah, it's too uh, bad. Holly Holm got injured. And Jorgen DeCastro versus Justin Taffa is going to move up and take its place. Jorgen DeCastro coming off a very impressive win on the Contender Series. And Justin Taffa, of course, being the latest uh, of prospects to come out of Mark Hunt's gym. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a Mark Hunt protege versus a Contender Series hopeful. It's very interesting. And uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Should we? Should we mention it? Yeah, do it. Go for let's, it. Let's all, the Throwing Bones podcast, we're going to get behind Jorgen DeCastro this week because hopefully, if all goes well, we're going to have Jorgen on the podcast next week at some point. So uh, we really want all the Throwing Bones uh, members to uh, get behind him. Yeah, show some support. Show that support. Especially if he's going to come talk to us knuckleheads for a couple minutes. For sure. War uh, DeCastro. War DeCastro. Uh, talking about another comeback that actually might be impeded here. Might be Something might be getting in the way of Anthony Rumble Johnson's comeback as today or yesterday, sometime in, in recent events, a warrant was issued for Rumble's arrest due to domestic battery. Yikes. Oh, wow. If we were still doing the good, the bad, and the ugly, this would be under ugly for sure. Yeah, that's tough. Um, I didn't hear about that. It really pumps um, the brakes on a yeah. comeback. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. I don't know like exactly what what it is or anything it's crazy. so we'll it find does, out a bit more doesn't circulate the on, news right? cycles as much when it's not about jones because i haven't yeah i haven't heard anything about it usually i do see stuff when yeah when stuff like this happens so we'll find out a bit more and, and then talk about it <clears throat> well he was going to come back at heavyweight right yeah do you want to talk about someone who is going to move up to heavyweight now yep let's talk about our boy the bricklayer Ilir latifi no he's decided he's decided he's moving up to 265 that will be crazy. <laughs> that it will be insane. And I'm saying, who who do we who do we get to welcome Ilir Latifi to heavyweight? I tell you, 
There's someone coming back off of an ill-fated retirement. Someone who's seven feet tall. And I think the skyscraper, Stefan Struve, would be a very, very excellent fight for uh, first fight at heavyweight for the human fire hydrant, Ilir Latifi. Yeah, I would love that matchup, honestly. That would be awesome That's, that's like old-style yeah. MMA, Yeah, right? that's like a pride matchup right there. <laughs> oh my god, I can't even believe that's possible. How thick do you think Ilir Latifi? He's going to come in looking like an actual square. Probably like 235, 240. Oh god, I think maybe, uh, maybe 250. Yeah, more. Who knows? I bet he can yeah. get like a thick boy, I bet I'd love to see it. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Should we talk about more serious news? Yeah. Frank Lester has is the latest of a slew of people to be leaving Jackson Winklejohn, uh, accusing John Jones of shorting him $13,000 for the training camp for uh, against Tiago Santos, uh, leaving pretty much calling everyone there a liar and a crook, and uh, essentially uh, insinuating that he was fired because, uh, or that John Jones orchestrated him getting fired because John Jones didn't want to pay him the money that he promised. Um, this has been a recurring theme at this gym, hey? Yeah. With it, Sanchez and Cowboy and Mike Perry. It just seems like there's too much going on at that gym outside of, of the training aspect. It mm-hmm. seems like there's lots of, uh, you know, lots of drama, some sketchy stuff going on over there. So lots of it's funny. I actually just read something that Frank Lester put out and it's like, John Jones always trains while on marijuana. <laughs> oh, yeah, that they'd, they'd ride around and smoke a blunt in the Jeep beforehand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember. I find that funny, yeah. Well, what what I find interesting and what I can't wait for is Monday morning uh, on the on the newest Ariel Hawani show because someone immediately asked Frank on his uh, announcement post that he was leaving the gym and opening his own gym in Albuquerque, you know, how much st- how many steroids are, is John actually on? Yeah. And he all all Frank Lester did was tag Ariel Hawani and say, Let's talk. Yeah. So, so that's I that mean, is juicy. He's going full Takashi on him. Full that's juicy. And and John's responded saying he's willing to take him to court. Yeah, so I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know. They're both meatheads, both knuckleheads, so figure we'll see what happens here. Speaking of meatheads and knuckleheads, we got a new episode of probably get off twitter and this week that episode is featuring one conor mcgregor because he tweeted out this week uh what date is the interim bmf title fight on uh you know hoping to hopefully get a fight that way somehow uh i don't know if we really need an interim bmf belt uh the diamond dustin poye responds to him saying Three years and ten days since he won your last fight. Do the math, champ. McGregor, uh, sadly, responds, Awesome, bro. Now count my bank digits. And all I'm saying is, do you remember when Conor McGregor had actually witty responses? Yeah, it's just so annoying, man. He's like the Floyd Mayweather MMA. It's just... It's just... Ugh. It's like, what a pathetic comeback. Yeah, it's just terrible, you know. He used to be so good. He, he was so classic. I actually saw someone respond to that, and it was uh, something about when you think of money, it makes you weak or something like that or oh, whatever. Something like, I, I saw yeah, something I like... I'm not like, sure what it was. I saw but, people going like, now count your arrests yeah. or something like that. Well, it's just stupid, man. It's like, it's like yeah, good for you. you. You made it. You did it. But it's like, for the last two years or however long it's been you've just been tweeting out about your comebacks and your returns and it's never happening so i want to see it happen it just it i want the old Mag- i want the old mcgregor back yeah i just you he know, meant so much to so many people and it's yeah. like really sad to see him become so vapid and pointless i just don't think after all that time off or and all that time off and all the money he's made you know he's mm-hmm. gonna be as motivated and to be that that same guy you know agreed well, I think that's all we got for news this week. I'm bringing in a new segment that hopefully we can do every week. We're going to keep our eye out uh, now from now on, interview stuff like that for just quotes that uh, that really catch our ears and are, we're interested in for one reason or another. I don't think Kyle has this one this week because I sort of dropped it on him last minute. So I'm going to introduce the first segment, quote of the week, we're going to call it. And my quote of the week for this week, Kyle, is from Justin Gaethje, the right. highlight, Okay. <clears throat> if one guy can hold you down two can rape you 
All right, that's all. We'll be back with our next segment of the Throne Bones MMA podcast, breaking down UFC 243. Thanks a lot, folks. And welcome back to the Throne Bones MMA podcast. This is our final segment of the week, breaking down UFC 243, the rumble down under Whitaker versus Adesanya with the beautiful co-main event, Iquinta versus Hooker, trying to determine the next bona fide contender in the UFC's most talent-rich division, Kyle Crikey. Crikey, mate. Holy, what a fight card we got coming up this weekend in Australia. Down under. Ah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm just going to let you hang on it. Yeah. Yeah, no. Got to go somewhere with it. I'm real pumped up for this weekend, (laughs) mate. Let's go get it. A bunch of sick fucks this weekend. Going to lock it up in that cage and get after it. All right. Well, I'll get us off of this train. (laughs) Who do you have in the main event? Who are you taking and why? Oh, I'm taking Bobby Knuckles in this one. Ah, actually, I'm changing it. Yeah, you're going last minute? I'm going, yeah, I'm going Adesanya. It's such a tough one to call. It is. Obviously, Robert Whitaker, he comes in, he has that power in both hands. Um, You know, his his whole, like, his rise to the top of the middleweight division, you Mm -hmm. know, he's done nothing but impress people. And defy the odds, you know. Lots of underdog wins, lots of big knockouts. Very true. On the come up, he's fought similar opponents to Adesanya, mm. and he's uh, had better results. He, I mean, they both finished Derek Brunson. Yep. Um, but Adesanya did fight Brad Tavares for five rounds. He did obviously outclass him in that mm-hmm. fight, Where, but whereas Whitaker knocked but, him out, yeah, in the first round. Yeah. So big left hook. And here's the thing: is that that signature left hook of Whitaker's? Coming in after the right, the only time uh, Adesanya has been knocked out in his entire career was by the glory uh, middleweight champion, Alex Pereira. It's with the exact same combination. Yeah, so... And and Whitaker has caught every single person that he's fought with it. Yeah, it, Whitaker's boxing is unbelievable. <sighs> um, they put out a video, ESPN put up a video on, throw, or on their <laughs> Instagram account yeah. and... It was him just hitting the pads at the open workout and the way he was moving, the way he was using his jab, um, it was beautiful. So I am pumped to see him, but I'm going to go with Izzy in this fight. Yeah, I'd say Whitaker for me, the way he game plans and the way he's integrated wrestling with his karate striking, to me, and the way he carries himself outside of the cage, to me, he really is the second coming of GSP. He's Australia's GSP. And, and, and the way I see it, sure, he's had trouble... Uh, with l- taller, rangier, flashier strikers than him. but uh, And the last time he fought one was Stephen Thompson. He got knocked out. But that was much, much longer ago. Whereas I saw Israel Adesanya having trouble with Kelvin Gastelum. I think uh, Whitaker is faster than Gastelum. I think he hits harder than Gastelum. I think he has a higher fight IQ than Gastelum. I think he has better wrestling credentials. I think was what everyone talks about the striking so much that I think they forget to mention uh, Whitaker's fight IQ and I think his willingness and ability to take this to the ground at opportune moments. I think that's going to be really the difference that a lot of people um, aren't getting at. They're going, well, if Gastelum could hit him, Whitaker could. I think that's absolutely true. I think Whitaker is going to make it so that he doesn't even need to hit him for the first round or two even. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I I think Adesanya is the type of guy he's going to make a lot of improvements, um, especially in, in the wrestling department and mm-hmm. the jiu-jitsu department. So even in his last fight against Gaslam, he did a way better job than we've seen in his previous fights. You know, I even thought he could pull off a submission possibly. That was a dog fight though, so oh, obviously yeah. both guys were tired, but... You know, it's he, it's cool to see even when he is tired, even though he is get, getting pushed to the to the brink. It's uh, he has he still has the skill set. He's still able to come out. He takes big shots in his last fight, and he kept coming forward. He, Absolutely. And um, you know, he finished the fight strong, and he won the fight yeah. with that fifth round. I do believe dropping gas oh, like I'm very close did. to finishing the fight. So definitely, it will be very very interesting. It's one of those fights though, because like. Whitaker has such heavy hands, and he's walked through the meat grinder. Yeah, exactly, and he's beat everybody. You know, everybody. like he, he's fought Yoel Romero for twenty five minutes, fifty minutes, or two fights. Yeah, sorry, twenty five minutes, minutes each. Yeah, um, each fifty minutes. Sorry, you got so. ja- you got Jacare too, and and you think about that, and you compare. It, what do you think of Israel Adesanya's uh, 
tendency to criticize Robert's opponents up until this point. Because to me, that is one of the worst angles you could take. Because Adesanya, although it's not, you know, unimpressive, his streak in the UFC, he's very much had a Conor McGregor-esque run to the title where, is it not respectable? Absolutely not. Did he face the absolute toughest challenges to get there the way Robert has? Not a chance. Yeah. Not a chance. And he did debut in 2018. So, you know, Mm -hmm. we're sitting here, October 2019. He's already won the middleweight interim belt, and now he's looking to unify him. Yeah. And, well, to be fair, um, it really does. It sort of rubs me raw. The way that he talks about that, where he goes like, you know, how how much have I fought? How much am I going to be able to do as a champion? Whereas, you know, he sat out for so long. It's like, well, a adult chicken pox and like your guts falling out of your stomach aside, he fought tw- 50 minutes with Yoel Romero and you went 15 minutes with a shot Anderson Silva and then barely got through Kelvin Gastelum, who was recently beat. Like, the, how do you get to an interim title shot at, at middleweight without beating Weidman, Rockhold, Jacare or Romero? It's because, it's because, though, of the way he's done it, right? The yeah. way he's carried himself and his yeah, style absolutely. of kickboxing. It's, oh, yeah. It's beautiful to watch. And, you know, in this fight, I truly think that that's why I'm picking him. is just because his, his striking is so good mm-hmm. and his ability to keep a range and just, you know, like pick off the, the shots mm-hmm. and choose choose the right shots. Um, I, I, that's why I see him winning yeah. this fight. Um, I mean, and that's that's totally fair it's just that even even if he does pull that off against robert i have a really 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 tough time uh seeing how he would be able to pull off victories against the romeros and the hermansons and even the the costas and the cannoneers of the division where they're uh they're so apt on the ground like i think romero would crush him yeah just especially seeing romero in his last fight just he took down uh costa so easy yeah the 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 durability of romero mixed with the raw power yeah and the wrestling credentials i don't know how adesanya would deal with it honestly. exactly I mean, so he'd run out of options so it's one of those things but it is also you know everybody has a plan till they get punched in the face and adesanya does a good job at tagging you up over and over again and and yeah it just seems like you know he makes people think in there oh he overloads your mainframe he he, he, he increases your cognitive load until your brain's overfilling with options that you need to deal with uh, bruce lee used to say if you think it's too slow there you go so so you gotta listen to bruce and and he confuses people in there and you know it's it's a really tough fight to call but i'm gonna go with uh, adesanya all right so you're going adesanya i'm gonna go for Whitaker, 100%. This is going to be a really interesting discussion next week, especially when we have the legacy of the fighter guys on to help us out with it. Yeah, no, it'll be awesome. Looking forward to that. Very exciting. And I guess if we haven't teased enough interviews yet this episode, we're going to have another one with some great documentarians, uh, legacy of a fighter. They've done interviews with Boss Root and Ken Shamrock, Dan Severn, uh, all the legends of the sport. It's really exciting. Randy Couture, all those guys. So Keep your eyes open for that, too. They're going to help us break down the uh, 243 card after it happens next week. Uh, let's move on to Iquinta versus Hooker. Oh, well, that's a tough... I was thinking this about that this morning, This one's an even tougher actually. fight to yeah, pick Yeah, I me. was thinking of that one this morning. Um, to be honest, this fight, it's so hard to call. And I love Al. I love Raging Al. I love, I love his Al. fight style. But I just think it's going to be Hooker's night. I think that, and I feel that too, and I'm wondering why my gut feeling is that for so long. And I think it's just because of how similar Hooker's style is to Cowboys. Mixed with, like, just the front kicks alone, the use of the front kicks and the stepping knees alone. Mixed with the fact that he is training his striking with Adesanya all the time. So, And not to mention that, who else is at City Kickboxing now with them all the time? Volkanovski. So I'd be super surprised if some of the grappling chops have not worn off on the rest of that team now that Volkanovski has been introduced to the group. And it, it, to me, this is really a question of, can I Quinta land those big shots? And can he mix it up with his wrestling enough that he, like you just said, gets Hooker thinking enough to where um, he's not just going to be completely outclassed on the feet from a range kickboxing perspective? Yeah, yeah, he's worried about the shot. He's worried about being taken down, so... So yeah, and um, I'm going to just throw it out there. I'm going to say uh, it's going to be a knee. It's going to be another knee. Another knee. For Hooker. Ducking in on a takedown or, or bobbing and weaving, do you think? It's, it's uh, 
He's probably going to be slipping and ripping. He's going to be bobbing and weaving and maybe just bump into that knee. All right. I, well, or I he's like going to – might even be a takedown. I could see a head kick. Yeah. I could see him slipping no, in a yeah. head kick. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Or I could be completely wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, he did have that – just have a recent fight with Cowboy where he, he saw some of those similar strikes, the front kicks. He, he ate yeah, some of those that, similar that strikes. That could have been an so. experience that he adapts to, right? Exactly. That's hard so, to say. So, yeah, it's going to be a great fight. Um, I'm going to stay with Hooker. Yeah, I am as well. All right, we're so. both going Hooker for that one. Uh, do you have a prediction? Is it knockout or decision? I got knockout. Knockout. knockout I think that it'll that probably go to a decision, but I'd say uh, I'm going to nominate this. I'm going to go ahead and nominate this for the Throne Bones certified banger of the night. All right, this is my guess. I don't know what yours is for the card. Yeah, mine's uh, Tai Tu Vasa, bro. Oh, versus Sergey Spivak. Yeah. Sergey Spivak, a common opponent of friend of the show, Travis Fulton. Yep. Travis Fulton, if you haven't checked out that interview, go check that out. Uh, so Sergey Spivak's going to go against Tai Tuivasa. And of course, I think we're both going Tai Tuivasa for this one. This I'm seems going like, Tai Tuivasa for sure. This seems like a matchup to get him back on track. Yeah. In and, his hometown. Yeah, exactly. And just seeing how he's coming off the losses, you know, it's... I think he's going to be coming. He's going to be swinging for the fences. And he's had the experience of a win in the UFC, the losses in the UFC. So I think he's going to come out and I think he's going to knock him out. Hopefully he comes out a bit more measured and, and paced and, and ready to methodically take out the take him to yeah. the finish. Yeah, I think he's going to come out, um, come out, be looking clean and mean and, and knock him out probably in the first or second round. All right, awesome. I'm gonna go first round knockout tie to Vasa. Damn. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna say second round just because I think he's gonna be a little bit um, reserved in the first round and feel him out a little bit more and try to be more responsible with his game plan. Yeah, I think he's gonna get in there. He's gonna swing a few punches and chug a beer from a shoe. I hope so, and I hope whoever is uh, covering, whoever is announcing, whoever's commentating, I hope they give him a shoe. Yeah. I hate that Joe Rogan won't do that. Yeah, come on, Joe. Yeah, right. It's so much fun. Like, Why are you not participating? Anyway, we're going to move on. I think we're going to skip Luke Jumeau uh, versus Diego Lima. We'll do that one after because I really want to make sure we talk about Justin Taffa versus Jorgen DeCastro. Two uh, big boys throwing lots of power. Jorgen DeCastro coming off a very impressive performance on on the Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. And Justin Taffa, of course, a protege. Uh, of Mark Hunt training with uh, Tai Tuivasa. Uh, this Australian New Zealand MMA scene really seems to be exploding and and bringing and bringing in light heavyweights and heavyweights uh, in a way that I wouldn't really expect. Yeah, no, it's cool. They obviously have a lot of talent there. I mean, Australia is known for their rugby, so uh, big guys, huge guys actually, and. Uh, powerful guys so it's it's awesome to see see them coming into the ufc and you know having success you know we, we've seen mark hunt um with his success in the ufc and it's awesome just to see how many prospects are coming out of there mm-hmm. i love the more diversity in nations that we can have in the sport the more i enjoy it the more yeah. the cultures you can learn about uh the more styles you're offered uh the more interest there is in general yeah no yeah it's awesome yeah, everybody has their own their own way of doing doing things anywhere you go. So it's it's cool to see all the different different styles and everything you get. Absolutely. Saying that though, there's really only one person to pick, and that's Jorgen De Castro. That is. All right. So the throwing bones is firmly firmly behind Jorgen De Castro. Lord De Castro. Lord De Castro, the man, uh, the man with the plan. He's got a family. He's making his dream come true, and he works from five a.m. Uh, until four in the afternoon every single day and works his training in around that. So it's very much a, the Jared Cannonier situation. It's very much the situation that Thomas Gifford, if you listen to our other interview that comes out this week, uh, he found himself in. And uh, hopefully he can go in there, get a huge performance bonus, and start dedicating all of his time to something that he's so clearly talented at. No, oh, yeah, for sure. And yeah, I also think, you know, I think these guys that work the full time jobs and stuff, you know, they. They come in and they're just so hungry, right? Because that's what they think about all day. You know, you're in there, you know, you might be doing something you like to do, but it's not what you love to do. What these guys love to do is fight. So it's awesome to see these guys when they get into the bigger leagues and they're finally able to start fully focusing on their training. I couldn't agree more, honestly. So right on. All right. So just to end out the show, we're going to go with Dudes I Know. One of my favorite segments. We got Jake Matthews coming in. Uh, 
fighting a guy. I don't know. I guess we're allergic to moving Jake Matthews up the rankings. I would have thought he's above that by now. I would have thought, you know, you move up closer to top 15, but instead he's still, he's got someone who I have no idea who he is. Maybe one or two fights in the UFC. And we're just going to keep putting him on regional, like regional, on the regional scene and not move him up the rankings. So that's a little bit disappointing. We got Brad Riddle, who is a hot prospect, according to Adesanya and Eugene Barman and Dan Hooker. He trains with them. Uh, so a new prospect from City Kickboxing. Apparently, uh, as far as they're concerned, he can shoot straight to the top. So I'm excited to see uh, what they see in him. And then, of course, we got Megan Anderson on the card. Uh, another uh, hometown girl uh, coming in to fight against uh, Zaria Dos Santos um, in a pretty much non-existent division. And we're not really sure if uh, women's 145 is going to stay around or not, or uh, if we should even pay attention to this as uh, a serious fight in the UFC, or if it's just something that's happening uh, while they figure out uh, whether, while they uh, make people, let people run out their contracts before they can cut them. Yeah, yeah, and also too, like with the 145 division, like if they want to let girls fight at 145, so they're not cutting down to 135, like I'm cool with that. But mm-hmm. it's just one of those things, like until they build it, build the division up with enough, uh, enough fighters, enough uh, like contenders, give you a reason to actually talk about the division in the UFC. It'd be, yeah, I, I would be fine with that. Besides that, like I've said, the division isn't isn't doing too much, so. It's, so kind of, it's Jake, kind of hard to yeah. tell what's going on there. Honestly, I just looked it up. Uh, Jake Matthews hasn't fought since uh, 2018, December 2018, when he lost via Anaconda Choke to Anthony Rocco Martin, and he's coming in against Rostam Ackman. Do you know Rostam Ackman? Is that No. I that do doesn't not. ring a bell to you at all? No. From Sweden, uh, fought his last fight against Sergei Kendazoko. No, uh, no in the idea, UFC. Yeah, yeah, so no idea. So I'm honestly like, even after losing to Anthony Rocco Martin, you probably should get more than that. Yeah, all I'm saying. Anyway, that's our show for this week. Thank you guys so much for following and listening. Make sure you join our group on Facebook. Follow the page so that you never miss anything, and you can interact with us personally. Uh, follow us on Instagram at Throwing Bones underscore MMA. Follow us on Twitter at MMA underscore Bones. Uh, you can keep up with uh, all the funny stuff we post, all the questions we ask, all the polls we take. And, of course, never miss an episode, never miss an exclusive interview, and never miss a brand new article. And thank you guys so much for being fans of the show. Thank you, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for those upcoming interviews we have with Thomas the Young Lion Gifford, uh, the, document, the creators of the documentary series A Fighter's Legacy. Go and check that out on YouTube. We're going to be posting that to the page too. And then, of course, Jorgen DeCastro. And make sure to get behind him and show him your support as a Throwing Bones MMA fan this weekend as he opens the pay-per-view to UFC 243. Right on, let's kick it.